last time we did Clinical Teaching 101, um, and this is really a continuation of that, so we're going to call it Clinical Teaching 102. Um, and I think last time you met Dr. Apentaku as well. We are both um, in the Office of Faculty Development and Global Health Initiatives at Chicago Medical School. And we both want you to know that we're available. So as you get started in the teaching, if there's questions, if the problems, we're available. And what I was actually going to recommend to Dr. Waxler was after you have students, after you've had a couple rounds of students, then that might be a time to come back and kind of sort out where are the challenges, where are the questions, um, after you've tried to put some of these things into action. All right, let's see. All right, so actually I need a volunteer to role play with me. Any brave souls that have already chewed most of their dinner? No, no brave souls. Oh, All right, okay. Would you come up front? Okay. All right, and bring the, a little the role play. Little thing. And I'll give you a minute. Yes, okay. okay, let's see. I was going to do the very last one, number seven. Oh, so you may, you may have a minute to read. Okay. And what I want everybody else to be looking for is this is a review from last time. The teaching styles, remember? assertive, suggestive, collaborative, facilitated, um, the Socratic method, the questioning, what text needs to be used, and what could we do to make it more effective of an interaction, a better teaching interaction. Oh, and would you like to be the student or the teacher? Learn. Learner? Okay. It's much more fun. A learner is much more fun. <laughs> you tell me when you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> 
I would say I would, we were trying what to be really more suggestive rather than anything else. Suggestive so was okay. Right. Yeah, I tried to be. Tried to be. But was it a, with, when I did the assertive part? Did that seem to be appropriate for yes. the student? Yeah. The, no. When you were explaining what the focused, um, how the focused um, uh, examination was, yeah. Okay. So, so yes, and so hopefully you'll find. Oh, yeah, she needs to jump. Thank you. You should find the same thing that depend. You know that you're going to use more than one style in an interaction um, because the students seem to need all of that. There really wasn't anything emotional, affective to me to use the facilitative, you know, how you feel kind of style to it. How about the Socratic method? Was that used? So, okay, can anybody explain what's the Socratic method? That's when you build on what the, what the learner already knows. They ask one question, they answer it, and then you build on that. And yeah, you good, very good. <laughs> and so they really, really know what's going on. It's just that you have to tease it out on them. And when they stop knowing, that's when you go to a certain. <laughs> Would you like to do that? <laughs> but that's exactly, thank you, that's a perfect explanation of it. So, so I would say not too much in this case, because um, one, it, it, we tend to use that when we're talking about a clinical problem or clinical information. Um, I tried asking the students some questions about what they knew about problem focused and how to approach a patient, but we didn't have a lot of understanding, at least that I could could learn or I could decipher from them. So couldn't really do the Socratic method. So it was one of those situations where they probably weren't going to use much of it. Okay. What would make the interaction more effective or make it better? Maybe using a specific example about that patient who gets ah, together. Okay. Like say when you ask this, you can do two of that specific. I agree, yeah. So actually talking more detail about that specific patient interaction and giving the students some feedback about the types of questions they ask and what information was truly relevant and what information wasn't. Yeah, that's good. All right, so you remember things from last time. Great. So at this point, I know that if you haven't had students yet, you're starting to plan. What are the things that at this point um, might be barriers to actually starting the teaching process with students here at Good Shepherd? The time. Um, yeah, because my day is already long. No. And, and I, can imagine, <laughs> I can imagine, I mean, it, take, yeah. it takes time. And I think explaining to the students that my patients come first. They do. They come second and I come third. My staff is in there somewhere. Somewhere, yes, yeah, somewhere yeah. there's that mix. Good, and we're going to talk a bit about that, some strategies that can help. Um, you are right, the teaching takes time. Now, I actually don't know if there's been a study looking at it in the hospital environment, in the office clinic environment when they've looked at it. it. It takes about 45 minutes out of the day for an experienced clinical teacher to provide the teaching part of it. How about a beginning teacher? It probably takes you an hour, an hour and a half okay. out of your day. <laughs> so, right. But what we want to do is give you some tools so that you can move quickly <laughs> to the 45 minute model. <laughs> Um, because the reality comes down to it is you will spend that extra time each day um, in some way. So you will either stay longer um, or you will see less patients, which usually isn't an option for many of us. So how do you then do it in a way where you minimize the extra time, but you're still effective in the teaching? So that's actually a large part of what we're going to talk about tonight. How do you do that? Um, other things, because that is usually the biggest barrier for people is the time. Um, knowing what things need to get done, what you need to teach. So I imagine there's some things that you, I mean, physical diagnosis, that sort of things, but I imagine there's a whole syllabus of things that has, have to be taught and how to get about getting that information and getting that information to the student. Good. Yes, we're going to talk about that too. How many students are we going to have per physician? I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to think, well, well I'm I would thinking think that. Isn't it? I'm sorry. Do you get one student at a time? Or one usually. So usually, um, in community settings like this, you'll have one student, maybe two, but you actually decide that. So when they're, when the school is contacting you saying, when would you like a student, how many students can you take, you actually determine that. Um, but you 
right that in this setting you're probably only going to have one student apiece or maybe even one student on your service if there's a group of you. Um, and I really do think that for most office settings it's hard to have more than one student at a time unless you really have a large practice group. Um, within the hospital, if you're functioning in a hospitalist model, then it might be possible to have more than one student, again, depending on how big your patient service is that you have. Um, but I would agree with you that starting out, you probably don't want more than one student apiece or one student on your service at a time until you get the hang of things and figure out the flow. Okay, good. So the good news is, um, because you're right, those are usually the biggest challenges for any of us, even if you've taught a long time. Um, and then this is just a reminder about the things we talked about last time, that keeping the learning experiential, application-oriented, um, observing the learner, giving them feedback, and using that Socratic method as kind of the core of how you do your teaching are the things that will make it effective. Um, effective for the learner and worthwhile for you. We're going to talk about the rest of that high cycle, that planning, and instruction, evaluation, and talk about the rest of the pieces and how they fit and interact. We're going to talk about specific strategies for that instruction evaluation piece, which is usually where most of us spend most of our time and have the most questions. But it introduced a framework called RIME, Reporter, Interpreter, Manager, Educator. Has anyone heard of that before? No. So it's a way to assess the learner and give feedback and do evaluation. And I think you'll find it easy and really helpful. And then we're going to do some more role plays to try to bring those concepts together so that you feel like you're ready to jump in when the students arrive. To give you just how to get us, um, so we're really working to have resources available online for you. And that's actually been a lot of what Dr. Akintaku has done. So this is our website. I know it's long. Um, we're hard to find if you just go to the main Chicago Medical School page. So that's the quickest way to get to us and the faculty development part of what we do. Um, so there are presentations on there. We're working on audio, although we've had recurrent technical issues. <laughs> I think I told you last time, I'm a family physician. So you know, I think everything's possible and all of it should somehow work most days. And the technical part is not as easy as we thought, but it's coming. Um, I'm hoping really soon. Um, there's links to other resources, so topics that we don't have yet in our own presentations. Dr. Abintaku has put together a list of other topics and resources that you can access that other people have developed. And then the information on faculty appointments. I know that Dr. Waxler is your point person and he's getting information out to you and he said he sent it to you in the mail and you're supposed to fill it in and give it to him. Um, you can also do it online if you want. So if you're the kind of person that doesn't like paper um, and would rather type it in, um, he can actually give you the website where you can go to and just type it in the form and then print the form out and sign it. So keep getting that to him um, so that he can help walk you through. All right, so the pie. Uh, remember, a food makes it easy. Remember, it's a dessert. That makes it even better. And it only has three letters. Yes. Um, we talked a lot about the planning last time. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And we're going to spend a lot of time on the instruction. So I'm going to kind of go what might seem to be backwards, but I'm doing it on purpose. Um, so evaluation, we always think of as being at the end. The reality is we have to gather our data and know what we're going to do from the beginning and throughout the whole process. So for evaluation, I really want you to think about it's emphasizing objectives and improvement. And when you mentioned about knowing what you're supposed to do, what are you supposed to teach them, that's where objectives come in. And that is something that you will get from the clerkship director. <clears throat> On the instruction part of it, um, we think of that as being the bulk of what we do, but again, it's directly tied to the planning. If you don't have the objectives and you haven't had time to plan for the students, you're not going to be very effective in the instruction. And if you're not gathering data along the way, you're not really going to be able to do evaluation very well at the end of the time. The planning part is where those goals and objectives initially come in. As I said, you'll get this from the clerkship director. Do actually read them. And I know that's hard because we all have lots of stuff to read, but really to look at them because, again, that will tell you exactly where the focus is supposed to be for the time that the student is with you. Um, and the other piece of planning is thinking about how are you going to integrate them into your practice. Um, we, gave you kind of, we gave you an example schedule for those of you that are office-based in doing um, in how you might be able to give the students some autonomy, but at the same time, um, observe them, make sure you see the patient because you actually have to do that and write a note and we'll talk about that in a little more detail tonight as well. Okay, so I'm teaching us. Planning makes it possible. 
So reading the things that come ahead of time, and if you have questions, get in touch with the function director. If you can't figure out who to get to, get to myself or Dr. Apataku, and we'll get you connected to the right person. Looking at really the schedule, how do you fit the student, the learner, into the seeing of patients and the 50 million other things you have to do. Um, taking some time for orientation, but remember, you don't have to do it all. So other staff can do it, and that's absolutely fine. Things like giving them the tour, telling them where their space is, anything about policies and procedures, those are things that somebody else can do. You don't have to do all that yourself. And we're going to actually spend a little bit of time talking about developing objectives so that you can be thinking about that process as well. And this is what I would call the interface between the planning part and the instruction part are really the goals and objectives. So the ones that come to you, you want to review those, but you also are going to develop your own as you determine where the learner is in the process of getting to the end goals and objectives for the clerkship, you're going to start developing objectives about what they need to achieve along the way to get there. Review the forms that come up front. Um, so one of the important success strategies for good evaluation is know what you're looking for before you even start to teach. Really try to set aside time for feedback, ideally every day, but if it doesn't happen on one particular day, that's okay. Um, but make sure it's happening at least once a week and you're actually going to be asked to document midway through the feedback and how the student is doing as well as then your final evaluation on the student. So schedule that time up front and when are you going to meet about halfway through, when are you going to meet at the end to sit down and re review their entire performance. So again, planning that up front, getting it on your schedule and the student's schedule will make it much more doable and much more feasible. So education objectives. Why do we care about these? Why do we even bother to do these? That's the whole purpose. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the whole purpose of this. Well, it is. So it determines the purpose, yeah. right? So objectives are how you define and explain what the purpose is. How does it help you in the process of assessing the student? Not just at the end, but through the whole process. Efficient. I don't know, efficient? Efficient, it does. So it helps with the efficiency, because if you aren't paying attention to the objectives, you don't have a clue where the student is in the learning process. And if it's week three, and you finally look at the objectives, <laughs> and you go, oh my goodness, we haven't done most of that, then the student's in trouble because they're not going to achieve what they need to and you're going to feel like, oh my goodness, I haven't fulfilled my role as the teacher and the educator. So the way I like to think of that is it's the way to keep the learner on track. Uh, without the objectives, it's really hard to keep them on track for achieving the final objectives and the goals for the course. Let's see if we got most of them. Um, and it's the way to determine whether they're learning. It's really evaluation. So without objectives, you can't evaluate because you don't know if they ever achieved what they were supposed to achieve. Keeps them on target, allows you to measure whether they're being successful or not as they go along the way, and will support the overall achievement of the clerkship goals and objectives. So what is an objective? How would you define this if somebody on the street said, hey, what's a learning objective? that you want to teach. Okay, so it's a concept you want to teach. How will you know whether you taught it or not? It depends on the objective. Okay, so um, I'd say that the objective for the end of the clerkship um, is that the student can demonstrate an organized presentation of a patient that is like the appropriate positives, negatives, comes to reasonable conclusion. How would you determine if they did that? You would ask them to present a patient. Oh. And, and hopefully they could complete it within three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you can put that in there. It has to be done in three minutes or less. And if it's and less, it still has to be relevant. And okay. they still have to be relevant. You know, but give them a defined goal to complete it in. You know, okay, good. So it was, it's specific, it's a behavior, and you can observe it and measure it. So those are the things to think about. But this should be something that you can see it, you can observe it, and therefore you can measure, yes, it was done, no, it wasn't done, it was done to this degree, or not done to this degree. 
Okay. Um, and specific enough that you could describe to somebody what they need to do and what you expect to see. Okay, so there are also domains for those behaviors. Any idea what domains we're talking, what areas we think of when we classify objectives? This is going to be easier than you think it is. Practical skills, theoretical skills, I don't know. Right, yeah. Theoretical yeah, knowledge. so knowledge, cognitive, thinking, exactly right. Attitude, how they interact, um, things like professionalism, respect. And then skills, and the skills can be technical skills, or they can be history and physical skills. And so some ways you can word them. So in the knowledge, um, identify diagnostic signs, and you can be specific about what that is. Um, describe diagnostic signs. Uh, develop a differential diagnosis. Describe the evaluation of a disease. Explain the etiology of the disease. Discuss therapeutic options. So all of those would be knowledge type cognitive types of objectives. And you could obviously be more specific, explain the etiology of um, streptococcal pharyngitis. <laughs> the lack of it. Um, attitude, exhibit or demonstrate sensitivity, empathy, respect, um, display professionalism, seek out learning opportunities, um, exhibit receptiveness to teaching and feedback. So those would be attitudinal types of objectives. And then for skills, performing a specific procedure um, so that they can suture a laceration with good wound edge approximation, um, perform a specific portion of a history. Um, they're able to perform a focused history on a patient that presents with knee pain and include the pertinent positives and negatives in the history. Perform a specific portion of the physical exam. Um, complete chart documentation, that's actually a skill. Keeping in mind that most of these knowledge, attitude, and skills also may involve aspects of other domains, but in an effort to just kind of classify it a bit. So, I need another volunteer to role play. And we'll do number six, so I'll give you a minute to actually look at it before you volunteer. <laughs> And you can decide if you want to be the teacher and the learner, but it is more fun to be the learner. Just now. I still haven't finished yet. Just a moment. Do volunteers?
do you think the rash is? Oh, it could be infection. Okay. Could be rash okay. How would you determine the difference? So you're right that a scraping, if you're thinking fungal, then a scraping would be helpful. How about for infection? What would help you decide that if it's not a fungus infection, it's a different type of infection? So specifically for a rash, how long has it been there? What other symptoms are there with it? Um, is there any, you know, are there specific symptoms of allergy? Does anybody else have the rash? So getting all of the details, good. How about in attitude? Are there any areas or concerns in attitude? So the motivation part, not taking shortcuts. So he was respectful. His interpersonal interaction with me was fine, but it's more about the attitude of taking shortcuts, not gathering all the information. So an objective of focusing more on completeness um, as opposed to willingness to do it. How about skill? More details exam, better to function, and come up with treatment options, testing options. And you're right that those those activities, those behaviors that we um, employ in the care of patients and gathering data about our patients, there's both a knowledge cognitive part and there's a skill part, right? So you have to know what questions to ask, but there's a the skill of asking the questions. Um, you have to know what part or parts of the body to examine, but then there's a skill in doing that exam process. Right. So how long do you think it'll take for the student to achieve those objectives? And it may be different for each of the objectives. Are those things that will take a day, a few weeks, a couple months? Probably longer for the attitude. Yeah, I would agree with you that the ad I think personally the attitudinal ones take longer, and especially things like motivation, right? Because that's so much personally, internally driven, um, that really working on that one, like how do you have that attitude? How do you change your, your way that you approach your work um, so that you really can do this well and be a physician that takes good care and provides high quality care? Um, so that will probably take longer. That may be something that's a several month process to go on. Um, and depending where you determine the starting point is, I think after you would go back in with the student and gather 
watch them in action and see more of what they do, you would decide better how long it would take. Knowledge is usually the easiest, right, um, to do, and the attitude usually takes the longest. Other questions or comments about that? You did very well as a student, thank you. <laughs> you have a future in your own life. <laughs> <laughs>